squeezing it. And I cleansed it with iodine and covered with gauze. I didn't know manuka honey then, so I used iodine. If, uh, people were here yesterday, I was talking about manuka honey. And my preceptor, who was a medical doctor, said we should uh, do back trim to cover and me piercing as well. And we did a wound culture. Um, it was negative for staff. And we decided uh, to do a surgery consult because it was such a big bump. Next slide, please. So has anyone heard about, uh, heard about the website called Up to Date? I know my U.S. counterparts probably know what Up to Date is. Here in Pinaster, Sir Alex, we use Up to Date. So, sir, sir. so Up to Date basically is our reference. You know, if you're a medical provider, you go to Up to Date and you get the recent Up to Date uh, clinical guidelines and management of diseases. So, what did the Up to Date website recommend? Um, you do an IN, for an acute abscess, you do an IND procedure at the time of the presentation, usually under local anesthetic. But for me, my preceptors are just squeeze that bad boy. So I was squeezing it the whole time, and this poor, this poor kid was just like, ouch, ouch. And if there are visible hairs, you need to remove that. And uh, the wounds are packed with gauze, and healing occurs by secondary intention. So just, you, just, you don't suture it, you just let it heal. And uh, they actually don't recommend the IND as the recurrence is 20 to 55%. For chronic ones, because we see these patients most of the time, they come over and over again, you know, a few months after they have that bump again. So the, the management for that is the surgical excision of the sinus tract. And the, there's a debate right now on the role of the antibiotics because people think, oh, it's, you know, it's a cellulitis, you know, it's, it's otherwise, like, you know, we don't need antibiotic because it will cause resistance. Um, but the first choice would be cephalosporins, such as cefazolin or flagell, such as uh, metronidazole. Next slide, please. So yesterday I talked about manuka honey. <laughs> so a year after, you know, my last clinical rotation, that's how I learned about the wonders of the manuka honey, which if you guys don't know yet from the U.S., you better get one. Um, so on my last clinical day as a nurse practitioner student, I was introduced to the wonders of manuka honey. Uh, so in that hospital, we use manuka honey. We drain the pilonidal abscess. And we basically just fill it with manuka honey all the way. Pack it, change it every day, once a day with manuka honey. And yesterday, uh, from our, my topic, I didn't really discuss price, but I looked online today, and they're kind of expensive. For a tube, it's 750 And for an adhesive dressing, it's about 5,000 pesos. So it's quite expensive. So, but if you want to go organic, manuka honey. Um, but in, in the U.S., I think uh, some of the insurance companies are covering it. I also had an opportunity to go to the OR to see how some of this uh, palonidal abscess are being excised. Because um, if you have chronic palonidal abscess, that's really annoying, right? Like you're oozing there most of the time. And so this is the kind of excision that they're doing. Uh, they basically incise it and then they suture it. Um, some of them don't want to do the midline um, and they want to do the off midline technique. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I'm glad that my presentation is after, <laughs> after lunch, but this is an example of how we drain a pilonidal cyst. I, I want to warn you, it's pretty graphic. So <laughs> you can close your eyes or look somewhere else. Right, you can need to start here and incision drainage of pilonidal abscess or a kind of butt abscess or buttock abscess. So he's been having this pain for about a week or so. Uh, came to the office today with this training thing, and looks like there's a lot of pus in there, and a drain under local anesthesia. Here we go. Uh, little stick in a barn.
One more time. Right here. One more time. Pinch in a barn. You doing okay? Ready, dear? Ready? You ready? All right. You feel anything? No. All right. Here we go. Oh, look at that. There's so much place in here, my friend. Yeah. Some yeah. people really like watching this kind of stuff. <laughs> it's like Dr. Yeah, Pimple yeah, Popper. Yeah, there's a lot of pus. We'll feel better after this, after all this pus comes out, okay? It's only a three minute one, so let's just finish it. Ooh, look at there. It's like your flower just came out so much. Yeah. So much press. You've been sick for several days, my friend. <laughs> oh, just keep coming. Oh my god. I don't know how you were doing this thing, buddy, but it's, it's so much pus in here. <laughs> you feeling good? And wait, yeah, there's more. Better. Let me have a suction. So do you have so much fuss in there? Do you have to turn the suction on? I was not expecting that much fuss in here. <laughs> do you guys want to stop the video now? I think we can stop. <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> you guys kind of like, kind of like this kind of stuff. But imagine me doing it manually for 45 minutes because <laughs> my preceptor doesn't want me to use local. So I had to do it on my first day of clinicals as a nurse practitioner. Yeah, a lot of there. All right. I think that's enough. My time is up. All right. So again, I want to end this presentation. <laughs> this couldn't hold more through to me. <laughs> Since I became a nurse practitioner, I haven't had to take my, my kids to the doctor. And if they have sniffles, hey, that's just viral, you know. We're only going to go there when, <laughs> when it's life or death. So I just want to end by saying I've been very indebted to all of my teachers here at Central Philippine University and I'm very grateful for an opportunity to share all of this with you and I'm happy to share moving forward any advices that you want and how you can also become a nurse practitioner as well. So thank you. Thank you so much Dr. Engler. Now we would like to call on again Dr. Baldon. Central Philippine University College of Nursing, the first nursing school in the Philippines, 1906, presents this Certificate of Appreciation to Christine Ayler, DNPRN, for sharing her time, knowledge, and expertise as a source speaker during the PNAA Balikturo 2020 Enhancing advocacy in nursing practice through global collaboration given its 24th day of January 2020 at Rosemore Auditorium, Central Philippine University, Haro Ilulu City, Philippines. Signed, Charlie D. Baldon, PhD, Chairperson, Attorney Salix Yalibuga, MAN, LLM, Dean College of Nursing, and Chidoro C. Robles, PhD, President. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ayler especially for sharing your pediatric advocacies. Our last but not definitely the least speaker is the PNA New Jersey Regional Vice President 2018 until the present. He will talk on when cancer hits close to home, 
on advo and advocating for safety. Let us all welcome Mr. Jonathan Gapilango. Good afternoon. Mayang hapon. Siguro masaot ko kaya nagkanta si Ma'am Maria Kaina eh. No, I'm just <laughs> I don't want uh, nga maulan kita diri subong. So anyway, um, I'm very grateful to be here today in front of you, uh, representing the, uh, not only as a Centralian, but also the PNA of New Jersey and PNA, of course, thank you, Ati Madeline, and the rest of the PNA present here today for um, choosing CPU to be uh, the balik turo for, today, uh, for uh, this year. So uh, my topic is just um, about advocating for safety, and I would like to to thank uh, my friend, Boss Dino Doliente, for helping me last time when I uh, did my presentation, how to make a title. So when cancer hits close to home, advocating for safety. I have nothing to disclose, but the slides cannot be reproduced without the permission from HPI. It's the uh, Healthcare Performance Initiative in the US because these slides were presented to us in the hospital for our uh, HRO or high reliability journey. I have three simple uh, objectives that I would like to share with you. Number one, describe practical steps in advocating for safety, not only for our patients, but for our family or loved ones as well. Give some examples or any examples of some of the most commonly used safety tools. And last but not the least, apply safety tools to our daily practice as nurses or nursing students as well. My personal journey, how do you advocate if it's your own? It's your own family. First, my mother-in-law was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 70 with a very good performance status. My sister-in-law diagnosed with breast cancer at age 55 with severe asthma and congestive heart failure. Third, my nephew was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer at age 21, was very athletic and very diet conscious. I will go back to that example later at the end of my presentation. So in our hospital, as I mentioned earlier, we are in our journey for HRO or high reliability organization because we would like to protect our patient. We would like to have zero harm to our patients as we give the care every day. So the Safety Together Quest is our journey to become a high reliability organization that focus on continuously improving our processes. We have to make sure that the processes that we have remains current and evidence-based practice. Second, Advocating for safety together will not only have positive impacts on, um, impacts on safety, but will engage all st stakeholders in improving patient experience and of, uh, overall operational goals. When there is good patient experience, they, uh, as I said early, uh, yesterday on my presentation, we are being evaluated on how we give patient care and it's being scored through the press gaining survey. And also we have another survey which is called eight CAPS. Last, our goal is zero events of preventable harm to our patients employees, and employees. So why we have to be safe when we go to the hospital? Evidence says out there that it's safer to ride a plane than to go to the hospital. We are so far behind in safety in healthcare compared to the airplane industry. It's a sad, it's a sad evidence out there, but it's the truth. So when you go to the hospital, sometimes you know you have only three things in mind as a patient or, 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 or if you're the family of the loved one. You just want to be, don't harm me, help me, be nice to me. If we can fulfill these three requirements, then we can, see, we can say that we did our job as nurses to, to, to give the best care to our patients. So I would like to give you six acronyms that you, I hope you will remember at the end of my presentation for safety. S, speak up for safety. A, accurately communicate. F, focus on the task. E, exercise and accept a questioning attitude. T, thoughtfully interact. U, you and me together. So I will give some specific tools 
for each of these letters. A, speak up for safety. So there are two tools on this one, which I will go on the next slide, which are called the ARC. So how do you escalate your concern using the ARC method? First, you ask a question. In other words, you, you, you offer a cruise check. If it doesn't request a change, offer another alternatives. Still no response. Voice a concern using the safety term called, I have a safety concern. If no success again, that's the time you escalate. So if you see something not right, you say, excuse me, you went to that isolation room, you didn't wash your hands. It can be your instructor, it can be a doctor, it doesn't matter. You have to be able to say, I'm concerned because you went to that room, you didn't wash your hands, and you're going to be spreading the infection, not only to your patients, but to everybody here in the nursing station. So what will you do next if, the, if you told the doctor, especially in the Philippines, some physicians, you know, even in the States, we still have some issues, but you know, because of our culture sometimes, we are not on the top of our game to approach our physicians. So if it does, then you escalate it. If you're a student to your clinical instructor, of course, if you're the nurse to your supervisor or you're to, nursing, to your nurse manager. Stop the line when uncertain. If you are uncertain about what you are about, if you have questions, if someone raises a concern, stop. Review your plan, reserve the concern, and reassess your actions. Don't be scared to stop the line when it's concerned patient safety. How about because even though you know, it's not your loved ones, we are here to protect each, you know, our patients. Remember Florence Nightingale, don't be scared to stop the line when you have to because you know what is right for your patients. Second, accurately communicate. Next slide. So in accurately communicate, we have the three-way repeat back. When an, especially when we're giving information. First, sender initiate communication using receiver's name. Sender provides a request information and receiving in a clear and concise format. Then the number two step, receiver acknowledges the, the message that you give and then request information if needed. Three, sender acknowledges the accuracy of the repeat back by saying that's correct. So if you get a call, as what uh, Sir Dino said earlier, sometimes, you know, when we are new to the States, we are scared to answer the phone because what, you know, what, what, we don't know what the doctor will say or sometimes it's hard to, to understand on the phone. So when you are not sure, you have to ask that person to repeat back. Did you order Tylenol 60, 50 milligrams PO, suppository? You know, also, there's a lot of confusing abbreviations. Thank God, you know, right now we don't abbreviate the left eye or the right eye. We have to specifically write them down. So when you get an order from the doctor, make sure if you're not clear, don't assume. Repeat back. This one is common to us, the letter and number clarification. We use this a lot, especially in the military. That when you say letter A, it should be alpha. B, bravo. I'm not going to go over because it's a very common um, you, you know, letter clarification that we use, especially for sound alike and look alike medications. But if they sound alike numbers, say the number in the digits. So when you say 25, you say 20 and 5. 50, that's 5-0, five, five, right? 50, doctor, 5-0. 45, 4-5. 425, 425. And then, four, then you have to say the range to eliminate the mistake. So make sure that you really accurately communicate whatever it is to the physicians or to your clinical instructors or to your co-workers. We also have one, um, one of these steps here, structured handoff. We have to provide thorough handoff of our patients regarding the care we deliver. We also call this now in the States, we do bedside reporting. We give reports in front of our patients. So the nurses in our hospital, they have to go at the bedside and make sure they involve the patient on what is the plan of the day or the plan of care. So to, because uh, you know, it's very important to have a thorough handoffs, you have to be accurate, the data, the date accurate, and you have to give relevant information. 
you have to cover contingency plan and precautions. You also should involve family participation because at the end of the day, it should be a family-centered approach. Patient and family-centered care should follow a standard format. And sometimes some other hospitals or some other units, they use a standardized format so that it's easy for them to follow when they're doing the handoff report. Next, please. SBAR or SBAR. S, situation. B, background. A, assessment. R, recommendation. So situation is the bottom, the diagnosis. What's the current situation? What's the problem right now at hand? Background, what do you think? The medical history or the test, prior tests or treatments? A, assessment. What's happening now? What's in the front of your eyes? Recommendation, what it is, what's next? What do we have to do? What's the plan of care? So for example, sometimes, you know, situation. You can say, Patient is complaining of headache. Background, what were the tests before? Did they do an MRI of the head, a CAT scan of the head? Assessment, did you check the patient's blood pressure? Is it high? Did you check for the respiration? Did you check if the patient had previous falls or maybe you know, the patient hit the head? Recommendation, so you can tell you know, to your clinical instructor, if you're a student, you know, the, I think this patient might need some tests like this because you know the patient fell at home there was no x-ray done or uh, we need to roll out more but a student you'll be able to analyze using s-bar it's a very good step for you to follow so that when you present your case to the doctor even as professionals you know when we give reports it helps us to guide us and to better safely help the patient on the current needs so the letter f Focus on the task. I like this uh, method a lot. We use this a lot because I work in the oncology floor, so we have a lot of high-risk medications in my area. Star. S. Stop. T. Think. A. Act. R. Review. So when there's something going on that you have to do, when you have to give a medication, pause for two seconds and focus on the attention at hand. Avoid interruptions. Only two seconds I'm asking, guys. And you can really apply this in your, uh, even in your personal life sometimes when you have to make decisions. Do I have to, make, to overtake a car in front of me? Do I have to make a right, a left? Think. Consider the action you're about to take. I am giving the right medication. Are, they have the same last names. The other one has, you know, a different first name maybe, but you know, Smith John and John James, or, or Smith James. And on, on, you know, in the worst is they're on the same room sometimes. So nursing students, when you are about to give your medication, please think, Con letter A, I said, concentrate and carry on the task. Once you do that, then proceed. You verify this is the right patient, the right medications. Review, check, check to make sure that the task was done correctly that you get the end result. What, did you give the medication the proper way it was ordered? Was it PO, IV, suppository? So make sure you practice the STAR moment and you will be able really to make sure that you're giving safe care to your patients. This is an example of STAR simulator. All of us, you know, we pass through the vending machine. So when you're about, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're really sleepy, you wanna get something or to eat, or sometimes, especially night shift, they want to eat something. So star, star simulator. So how do you apply S here? Stop. You know, you think, oh, do I really need to get this candy? I'm on diet. My A1C is 6.2. Or my blood sugar this morning when I checked was 180. Do I have really need a candy right now? Or I can hold off? Two seconds. Act. Uh, sorry, think. Which one is the best one? m and Baby Ruth? Or Snickers? Act the moment you hit that button and put your money. That's the act portion. So you selected what you want. It's A1, A2, B1, B2, whatever, the line on the vending machine. Review. You still have to check if it's the right product that, came out, that comes out of that machine, right? You don't want to be uh, get, get, getting the wrong candy and then you're not happy about it. 
So that's an example of a star simulator. E, exercise and accept a questioning attitude. This is very true, ladies and gentlemen. I will follow my instincts to resolution and accept the question of others. Sometimes, especially, uh, you know, some of us, when somebody gives us criticism, we feel, we feel bad. We think that, you know, that they're smarter than us. No, because, you know, sometimes we have to accept the fact that we're not, you know, we don't know everything, even we are experienced nurses. We still have to listen to somebody else when they question us. We have to validate and verify. Validate, quali qualify the source, and ask yourself, does it make sense to you? What I'm about to do right now with my patient, it doesn't sound right. This is not the way I learned from my, from my clinical instructor or what, what you know, I was reading on my textbook. This is something wrong. Verify, check it out with an independent, independent expert, expert source. Go to your clinical instructor if you're not sure. Even clinical instructors, if they're not sure, they're going to go to their colleagues or ask, you know, Dean Salex or check the, the book. So there's a lot of resources you have. So never proceed with your, with your action if you're not sure about it. Even the little feeling that something is about to go wrong because that's when gonna, mistakes going to happen. Clarifying questions. Ask one to two clarifying questions in all high-risk situations in the OR in the ICU areas, when the information is complete, when you got report from your coworker and you, you know, you didn't, patient had a fever, but you didn't know when was the last time he or she gave the Tylenol. How will you do the follow-up? How will you, you know, give the next dose? When information is not clear, sometimes, you know, we tend to hurry, especially at the end of the shift, you're going to a party or you're going to go somewhere. You don't give accurate information to the next shift. Please. Do yourself a favor. Make sure you give someone an accurate and clear information. Use the, si the safety phrase, let me ask a clarify clarifying question. Even students, I empower you. When your clinical instructor is teaching you something and you're not sure about it, they will not get upset if you say that, ma'am or sir, can I please ask a clarifying question? And the instructor should be able to accept that too, that sometimes, you know, there's some evidence out there that the students have, you know, read or uh, seen somewhere. So just please, you have to empower the students that they were able, that it's they're free to ask clarifying questions. But make sure students be also be pro professional and polite when you do that. Letter T, thoughtfully interact. Next slide. So totally interact with five tones. So what do we do when we see, our, you know, when we approach our patient at the bedside, they're, they're lying on the bed, they have no family member, you know, they have a very bad day, they don't feel good, they're in pain. But these five tones will make a difference. Smile and say hello. It doesn't cost anything to smile. They said it takes 15 muscles to, right? How many muscles to smile? 15? Explain, introduce and explain your role. Are you a student nurse? Don't be scared. It's okay. But as long as you're you know, telling them you know, you're a student nurse and how long you're going to be there. Number three, listen with empathy and intent to understand. We have to be able to actively listen to our patients because sometimes when they talk to us, our minds Oh, you know, I have an exam later. I'm going to study. I didn't do my, my term paper yet. So make sure, guys, your patient will know it when you're not paying attention to them, when you're not listening to them, and you're just pretending. You're physically present, but you're mentally absent. Four, communicate positive intent of your actions. You have to tell them why you're doing such procedure to alleviate the pain, or they might be going to the OR to remove certain conditions that they have. And number five, provide opportunities to ask questions. Before you leave the room, we always tell our nurses, but some don't, we know. We, uh, we have to tell our nurses, before you leave the room, I have the time. Is there anything else I can do for you? How does it sound if you're the patient? How will you feel about it when your nurse said, you know, I, you're done with your assessment, you give the meds, you give your bed bath. If you have any, you know, I have the time. 
let me know if you have any questions. So, you know, it will, it, it will make them feel better. So just to do a crosswalk, there's also an uh, the AIDET, A-I-D-E-T. Same thing with the five tones. Acknowledge and welcome, the same, uh, the step one earlier. Introduce yourself. Duration, so you tell them how long you're going to be stay. Are you a seven to three chef? Explain and, um, and listen carefully, the same I said, you have to listen. And thank people in your organizations. As I said, this is for the Robert Wood Johnson, but you have to thank to thank the patients, you know, for allowing you to take care of, you know, for allowing, for you to allowing them to take care. Another one for um, you and me together. You and me together for letter Y. Cross check each other. What does it mean is cross -check, uh, to cross check each other? What do you mean? I'm a nurse for 30 years. She's only a nurse for a year or six months or a new grad. Why will she cross-check me? She has no credentials. She's not a DNP. She's only an RN. No, guys. No matter what's the status, what credentials we have, we still have to cross-check. I will look out for I'm, I will look out for my team members and be willing to be coached. Each of us can benefit from coaching that will have that just will help us grow professionally and personally as nurses. There's also the five to one feedback. You know, sometimes, right? It's hard to give positive feedback. Especially Filipinos, I'm not sure. We kind of more leaning on the negative feedback. Correct me if I'm wrong, I stand corrected. But you know, when you give positive feedback, it's really encouraging to someone to continue practicing on the behavior that you observe. When you tell something, wow, awesome job, great job. You did good in your presentation. Does it cost you anything to say that? No. But it will help empower your coworker, your classmates. Clinical instructor, please, when your students does a good job, if this is their first rotation and they, you, you observe them to be very comfortable in approaching the patient, please tell them a great job. It will lessen their fear and anxiety. But when you do negative, the negative feedback is discouraging, you know, it, is this nursing all about? So we have to be able to always think about give at least five positive feedback and only one negative. So as I go back earlier, I said to my slide, what do you think are some of the safety tools that I use to advocate for my loved ones? The first two situations, my mother-in-law, when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, I was, you know, I was in the States and she was here. When the doctor told me, Jonathan, we're not going to give your mother-in-law this certain medication because it's going to make um, her blood count low or she will be tired because she's at 75 years old at that time. I said, no. I stopped the line. I asked her different questions. Why? We have to try because in the States, we even give chemotherapy to 90 years old. My mother-in-law has good performance status. So I told the doctor, please, I was even the one who completed the dose for her. I, you know, at that time, there was no Facebook yet. Or, so we, we talk, communicate through email. I will send the order, and I will you know, make sure that I tell the doctor where I get the orders from. We use the NCCN guidelines or the basis for our orders. My sister-in-law diagnosed with breast cancer, severe asthma, and CHF. You know, when you have congestive heart failures, there's medication sometimes that affects the ejection fraction. It's the, it's the way that the, the heart pumps out blood. So the doctors here in the Philippines told me, we have to cut the dose to 50%. I said, what's your basis for that? What evidence are you using? What guidelines are you using? So it, it depends on what's the ejection fraction of, you know, of my sister-in-law. Then we can adjust the dose, not just put up front 50% right away. Again, clarifying, you know, question the doctor politely. You use the star. You know, and then you can use also the, you know, I, I cannot arc it up because I'm the family member, but if it's for someone else, you can arc it up to an expert that also knows oncology. My nephew, this is a very, uh, he's in the States. It's a very rare form of cancer. It's called germ, uh, germ cancer or seminomal cancer. What happened was, when he was just on the evolution phase inside the womb of my cousin, the sperm, 
that supposedly go to his testicles didn't go down. It stayed on his chest. Imagine that. It's only happened, I think, one over 1,000 cases. So the, the, this, the sperm didn't go down to his testicles during growth and development inside and stayed on his chest. One day, he was just taking his vitamins. You know, the vitamins, they're like big, you know, horses pill, we call them. Got stuck on his throat. So when they called me, he was in the ER, they called me, you know, that um, they found a big uh, tumor on his chest. I said, what? So then when they did the test, it was found out that it was seminoma. They cannot do surgery on him because it was close to his heart and might, uh, you know, he's a high risk to develop more severe condition if they do the heart surgery. So we opted chemotherapy. Two days before chemotherapy, the, the doctor said, oh, we're going to start your nephew on a chemotherapy and, uh, you know, just to let you know, this is the medication. I said, hold off, doc. He's only 21. Did you consider sperm banking? Did you ask my nephew if he wants to have a baby someday? He's only 21. So there, I stopped the line. We hold the chemo for three days because it's easy anyway to get, you know, there's a, a lot of agencies. We, ha we did sperm banking for him because, you know, at, at, at 21, you, will, you know, even though he will not want a baby someday, but at least we have the sperm to preserve it because, you know, chemotherapy does affect the sperm mortality and that causes some side effects to the baby, you know, when he's ready to have his own family. So this, you know, those are some examples wherever you are. You can be in the States or, you know, like students when you go someday. Please advocate for your family because sometimes, you know, if you don't speak up, it's not going to change the care. I'm not saying all, you know, all physicians or practitioners, but just be on the lookout. We are here to be advocate for each other, for our family, and for our patients. So again, letter S, speak up for safety. Letter A, accurately communicate. F, focus on the task. E, exercise and accept a questioning attitude. T, thoughtfully interact. Y, you and me together. We are on this journey for safety together that someday we can say, wow, healthcare is already like the airplane industry. There will, there will be zero harm. It's a safe place to go whenever you need something. So on the right, on my right, is my nephew. He's 28 now. He's actually becoming a pastor. He's finishing his online course. His name is Paolo. And I'm so proud of him because, you know, he, he fought so much at that time when he was having his cancer. And, you know, he calls me. And he's a good friend to my son who is 13 in the middle. His name is Josh. And please pray for him. He's doing his spelling big contest tomorrow for New Jersey. And I'm not there, so I just need prayer for my son. And I thank you. I have one question. I will get, give a prize also, you know, like Christine. I will give 1,000 pesos. Whoever can go to the mic first and, the, and state the acronym safety will get 1,000 pesos. Whoever can go to the mic first and say the safety acronym will get 1,000 pesos. Is there a microphone in the middle? Where's the microphone in the middle? No cheating, huh? No, you have to read it. Can you state your name when you're here? Nielsa, <laughs> Nielsa, Nielsa. What's your name? Nielsa. <laughs> okay, okay. Take a deep breath. Okay. You wanted some water first? Water, sir. Yes. Okay. Water. I don't want the first aid crew to come up here. So, are you ready to state the acronym safety? No, sir. <laughs> Not yet? What's the acronym, sir? So, what's, what, I told you if you can state the word safety, what's letter S, letter A, letter <laughs> F, letter E? Anybody wants to help him? He can have one lifeline. <laughs> Come on.
Let's give them um, a round of applause for the effort. Okay, we have another one. The brave one. Okay. Okay, so I'll try. Just try your best. What's My your name? name? Is Mia from BSN3. You, you all? So, S is safely. I speak. Let, go ahead. Speak. Speak up for? Speak up for safety. A, accurately communicate. F. Focus. Focus. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Focus on the. It's okay, go ahead. I think she was brave enough to come up here. Focus on the task. Fo focus on the task. E is. My goodness. Ex exercise. Exercise. Safety. And accept a questioning attitude. Okay, yes. letter T. T, I'm so sorry, sir. I do not remember. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. You can. Okay, I allow you now. Okay, so I'll start from the beginning. Speak up for safety. Accurately communicate. Go ahead. Go ahead. Focus I allowed her. On, focus on the task. Exercise and accept the question attitude. You and me together. So guys, thank you. I'm still gonna give you. You can split with him, the one thousand. So please, practice safety all the time. And thank you so much. I'm the last speaker, but I'm, I'm privileged to, to speak to you and make, especially the students, please don't be discouraged. Please practice the safety tools I gave you, and you will really be able to deliver the quality care to the patients here in Iloilo City and when you go abroad someday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Gapilango, for sharing safety advocacies. Truly, as nurses, we should advocate for safe, quality nursing practice. And don't forget, you and me for safety advocacies. Let me now read the certificate of appreciation as Dr. Baldon is uh, going to, present, to award this. Central Philippine University College of Nursing. The first nursing school in the Philippines, 1906, presents this certificate of appreciation to Jonathan Gapilango, DNP, candidate, MSN RN, for sharing his time, knowledge, and expertise as a source speaker during the PNAA Balik Turo 2020, enhancing advocacy in nursing practice through global collaboration, given his 24th day of January 2020 at Rose Memorial Auditorium, Central Philippine University, Haro, Ilulu City, Philippines. Signed, Charlie D. Baldon, PhD Chairperson, Attorney Salix E. Albuga, M-A-N-L-L-M, Dean College of Nursing, and Chidoro C. Robles, PhD President. Okay, a round of applause. At this point, let me call in, on stage, the four speakers in this afternoon afternoon session for a short interactive discussion please we have mr dino doliente ma'am eden uh, maria eden gannon of course, Dr. Christine Ayler and Sir Jonathan Gapilango. Okay, any question for these uh, four speakers? Once again, good afternoon. Welcome to our afternoon session, interactive discussion. Now, at this time, I would like to request students, faculty, if you have questions, you may write in a piece of paper. You give it to me or you can read your questions. Again, 
level one, level two, three, and four, may I request you to write your question in a piece of paper and give it to me, please. Now, these are, may I request Dr. Jerumahom to please come up the stage, please? Is Dr. Alma Jerumahom around? I saw her earlier. She's not around yet. Okay, once again, good afternoon. The following topics for today. This afternoon is, so I want to go to America. Advocacy for Recruited Foreign Educated Nurses by Sardinio Doliente. Maria Eden Gianan, life is full of ships. Understanding depression in life's transition. Also Dr. Eller, pediatric interactive clinical case studies. And Sir Jonathan Cabilango, when cancer hits close to home, advocating for safety. Again, level three, four, do you have any questions? Or we can, from the clinical instructors, you can write your questions in a piece of paper and give it to me, please. Now, this is for Dr. Eller. As someone who is thinking of pursuing a career as a pediatric nurse practitioner, what are the responsibility and activities you do on a daily basis? What steps did you take in? What steps did you take in order to be a pediatric nurse practitioner? Thank you for that very beautiful question. Um, my journey to getting my Doctor of Nursing practice degree wasn't smooth sailing. I was pregnant with my, my two kids actually were born while I was finishing my master's degree and my DNP degree. I was two weeks postpartum and I had to do my first clinical and had to squeeze that palonidal abscess. So it wasn't easy. Um, it takes a lot of sacrifice, but I was very committed to getting my terminal nursing degree because I want to do it now rather than wait. And you may decide to prioritize and say, I'll do family life first and then I'll go back to school. But I was very fortunate to get a scholarship from University of Washington for a DNP program. It would, pro would have probably costed me $100,000 to get my nurse practitioner degree, but I was able to do it without because of the scholarship, so I'm very grateful. So I was just trying to chase for the opportunity. I was trying to make sure that I take advantage of all the scholarships and the opportunities available, because given you know the US and the budget cuts, you never know if those tuition exemption will be available in the next five years. Um, but then, that would also mean I would have to sacrifice family life. Um, my husband, who I thought got a lot of cheers when you saw the picture, he really had to put up with me. Um, a lot of my classmates are actually on anti-anxiety meds. <laughs> and in grad school, sometimes you have to. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not <laughs> into drugs. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> but you take, you basically, you, um, it's not an easy walk in the park. Uh, you need to have uh, a support system. Um, and especially if, if, you know, if you have a family behind you. So you need to have a support system because um, financially you have to think about who's going to pay for the bills. Who's going to pay while you're in school, right? Um, so you also have to take this into consideration. And come time that I needed to practice, I had to choose a job that would support my family and I, I actually work from home. So that's one thing that I'm really grateful that as a nurse practitioner, I can actually work from home and what I do is I, I do phone triage. So I get community calls. Um, it might not be, it's probably just a few dollars less than if I have to go to the hospital, but I chose to work from home because that way I can still work, I can still get practice but then I'm in the comforts of my home. I'm basically wearing my pajama when, when I'm working. Um, 
So you, you choose what would work for you because it's not always going to be chasing that dream. It's not always going to be that, oh, I want this dream job. Um, I decided I'm going to just choose a job. It still supports my practice hours because if you're a nurse practitioner, you need to also prove to the board that you've had continuing education hours. Um, so for me, staying at home, working, and keeping up with my, like attending this conference, or learning from other people, learning from other experts, that's how you continue to harness and hone your skills and it never ends. Once you're a nurse practitioner, once you have a master's degree, um, you'll always continually learn. So it's not that after you graduate, it's done, but it's, it's a never ending process, but it, it's, it's a good process. Hello. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, my next que uh, uh, my question will be for all four speakers. Um, this is about uh, since you all are experts in your field, I would like to ask if how feasible are the program courses or your specialties? Um, applicable or how feasible is it here in the Philippines with our country's current political and economical climate? And to follow up that question, uh, what or what will be your suggestion or what would or what do you think will be the perfect climate for such specialty or special areas, special area courses to be offered after um, bachelor's degree or after master's degree? Again, sorry. Again, for my question for all our speakers as experts in their uh, uh, respective fields, how feasible is Philippines um, with our current political and economical climate? How feasible are your specialty area courses um, be applicable here? Is it feasible or not? Or if it is feasible, what will be the conditions that will be perfect for such courses to be offered here in the Philippines? For example, in the pediatrics or in the psychiatry or in, in oncology. Thank okay. you. Okay, for psychiatry. So, we will think it is almost applicable. It is feasible. We can do, there are challenges that we will face like the speaker earlier about the promotion of APN, Advanced Practice Nursing, there is always a way, like there's no nurse anesthetist that is approved by the Board of Nursing. However, there is a way through the Department of Health and we have now care, a nurse an anesthesia care, right? So for psychiatry, it is feasible, for example, personally, if I will if I want to apply what I have learned in the States and also what I have learned from here, the basic psych nursing, I was trained in Pututan and it, it motivated me to become a psych nurse because I, during my exposure in Pututan, that was my love for psychiatry. I fell in love with it. So during the exposure, my career developed in Pututan to be a psych nurse. When I saw a patient and I didn't really know what to do. So when I said to myself, when I go to have my master's degree, I want to have a psychiatric nursing. So I, there's always a way. There's always a solution. It's always visible. Look like the example of uh, Dr. Ayeng did for nurse anesthetist care for the nurses. We have two people who is doing it now, uh, which I met during the conference in Boracay. For psychiatry, I could always approach. What was that the, here, the department um, in, what is the department here in, in the Philippines? I did not really contact them, how feasible I am able to be able to help. And the courses, of course, you know, it's like our emotion is very common. We all smile, we all get angry, get all depressed and anxious. Whatever is applicable in the United States, the books that we have used 
That's why when I went to the States, I passed the NCLEX immediately because the books that we use here are applicable to the United States. We use the same textbooks. The same textbooks. So advanced courses that we have in the United States, the courses are really applicable in our country. As you see in my talk, I use Eastern medicine. See, I did not talk about medications a lot because what it is happening in the Western, uh, Western practices for psychiatry, they use a lot of meditation. And we already use it here. We use a lot of prayers, mindfulness. Herbal medication is coming back in the United States. Americans come here to study about our herbal medication. So how feasible it is, it's really, really applicable. And I want to um, connect with, uh, with the higher education here, and I don't, want to, I don't mind to be a consultant, uh, to help improve the psychiatry uh, service here in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gannon. So no. for, uh, for oncology, oh, for my certification, I didn't really uh, took a form, I didn't really take a formal course, but I just did uh, an online review course. But you have to require, they required 2,000 hours uh, exposure in the field of oncology, of course. And I know that the oncology nursing certification in the U.S., they do offer international a certification, it's just hard to maintain because it requires so much uh, contact hours. But they do because sometimes when we have international convention, we have other um, uh, nurses, oncology nurses from Southeast Asia represented. I think one time I saw Philippines being represented. So it's possible and it's, you know, you just have to have the, the required number of hours before you take for the exam. But you can take the exam on your own pace, you know, because of your busy schedule. And then you, when you're ready, you take the exam and you can review online. There's a lot of resources available online now. Some are free, some are, you know, some you have to pay. And if you're interested further, you can contact me later. I can um, give you more information on how to be, if you're really looking, you know, for certification in oncology or other uh, areas of um, different specialties. <clears throat> uh, for, for me, um, Remember when I said earlier that I'm one of those nurses who became a nurse and it wasn't necessarily my passion, right? And when I first practiced as a nurse in the U.S., I had to take a step back and reflect, what do I really want to do in my life? And I've always liked numbers. I've always liked that sort of like business operations. How, how do hospitals work behind the scenes? So needless to say, when I got the opportunity to go back to school, I did not take master's in nursing. I took my master's in business administration because I think that was my trajectory. And it served me well. Now I work uh, for a healthcare company still. So I'm still able to, to have my, the clinical component of it, but I also have the business and the financial background or foundation for that. So it served me well. You know, they said in the US, well, one good thing in the US is that as a nurse, you're not stuck with like what um, senator, that senator said before, <laughs> that, you will, you, that you will just be a bedside nurse. In the US, there are so many things that you can do. Oncology, psychiatry, nurse practitioner, case management, administration, informatics, nurse anesthetist, name it, academia, you can have that. So all you have to do, I think, is to reflect back. If you feel like you're stuck now with the course, right? But what else, what do you really wanna do? And once you decide that, there are so many avenues. And if you're in the Philippines, the question is, if you're in the Philippines, is the climate uh, perfect or is it applicable? It's still applicable. Because if you're a nurse now, and you graduate, you become a nurse, and then your trajectory though is like, you feel like, like me, like, you know, I wanna be like, to, to be involved in the business operations, then you have MBAs here, right? You have business management as well. Or if you wanna teach, then go for your master's in nursing so you can work in academia. So I, I think it's still applicable. In the U.S. now, for chief nursing officers, for chief medical officers, they said that uh, hospitals and healthcare, however you look at it, it's business. So if you will be leading as a chief nursing officer or a, a chief medical officer, 
you have to understand the business operations. In fact, a lot of the chief nursing officers now, and even CEOs whose background is clinical, they are being encouraged or being prompted to take MBAs. Because one, cl knowing clinical is one thing, but at the same time, a, a, a big component for a hospital or the healthcare industry to be successful is to know how the business operations work in finance. So that's all, thanks. I just want to add, and I want to be mindful uh, if this was already mentioned by Dr. Dollar from earlier presentation regarding advanced practice and her advocacies. Uh, I think we will be having a lot of challenges here in the Philippines. It's visible, um, but it will involve policy changes. And uh, policy changes because the curriculum will change or you would have to uh, have a faculty that's also advanced practice degree because you don't want a BSN teaching, uh, you know, a nurse practitioner, especially now that we are still being um, beset by um, master's prepared educators. Um, also, even in the U.S., it's a very sensitive topic. Like, I have a DNP degree, so I'm supposed to be called a doctor, right? But um, that is a very touchy subject when you're talking to a medical doctor. So what would our medical providers here in the Philippines think about a nurse performing the same responsibility that a doctor would do. Do you think the um, Philippine Medical Society would be open to supporting this cause? So it will take a lot of energy and um, a push from nurses um, and to be empowered uh, to really advocate for this because that would also mean they will, you know, they will have a competition, you know, especially why would you, you know, see a doctor and get a PFP of a few thousand dollars when you can see a nurse practitioner for just a fraction of the cost. So it's a very sensitive topic and it will require a lot of policy changes and definitely a lot of going back and forth. So, but just to add to that, the clinical um, preparation, we can do it. I mean, what you have right now, what we have in CPU is not even a cinch of, of the clinicals in the U.S. So, you know, so, the, so thank your clinical instructors if they're very strict because you will only use that discipline when you go to the U.S. and get your advanced practice degree. I mean, I was able to survive uh, because I felt like this is not even <laughs> close to yung pagka-estricta ng mga CI ko sa Pilipinas. So it's very doable. As long as you put your mind to it, um, it's uh, definitely doable. Thank you. Honorary questions. Um, hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Paul, and I'm working in, uh, in the nursing informatics uh, department. So, uh, my question is, uh, as our hospital transitions into utilizing the electronic medical record, uh, what are some good practices you can impart to us, especially concerning safety on medication administration? I, for example, uh, computer and wheels, so that's, we, uh, that's what we are focusing right now. So for us, um, my organization, we're just embarking actually, currently we're using Cerner, but uh, we're not happy about it. So the organization took a stand and we're changing to Epic because Epic uh, is the most widely used, I think, world world uh, HR. So there's a lot of, like for chemotherapy alone, they were, they're gonna be able to build the pathways, build uh, based on the NCCN guidelines so that when the patient's labs changes, weight will change, the medication dose can be adjusted. So there's a lot of safety tools on the EPIC that we're going to be converting, but it will take us three to four years to finish because as of now, there's 11 hospitals, so they have to do one hospital at a time. But even though, as I said, even though we're going to be going to EMR, there's still a human factor that we have to do as nurses. We still have to, you know, the, the, the safety tools that I discussed, you can still use that, you know, because if computer does make mistakes, we cannot deny that fact that even with perfect, there's no perfect AMR, there's still gonna be some, you know, some mistakes here and there, so, you know, but it will help really improve patient safety, it will help efficiency, 
especially also with data mining, they, they knew AMRs, if you need somebody, you want to know the blood pressure of your patient for the certain time, certain hours, you want to know their temperature, you can just data mine and they will help you do a better care plan for your patient or what's going on, diagnose quickly and easy. So I think, you know, uh, the, the new, generation, new generation of AMR coming out in the U.S. will be better and really will promote patient safety and zero harm to the patients that we will be taking care of. If, <clears throat> if I could, oh. Do you, if, do you use any of the hospitals here use electronic records? Yes? Yeah? Or still right? We are still on transition. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I work for the Veterans Administration and they have, they call computer, also uh, electronic mm -hmm. health records. So what happened is with the veterans, they, they move from one state to another. So they, if we ask them a question, safety-wise, what are your medications? So we do a medication review. And if the patients say, oh, I'm on this medication, sometimes they could not remember, we will go to a remote control data, which means if they are in Boston, we will know what kind of medication they are in Florida, in Alabama, wherever they went. They cannot lie to us. In my private practice, we are, it's really very safe for me because of the opioid epidemic. The Massachusetts, we have to log in in the government data and check if Dino used heroin, for example, and then he, got, and he asked me for Xanax or, or any anti-anxiety medication. And when was the last time he was prescribed and he's not doctor shopping. So if the, I, I see in the government data that he got the Xanax from another provider, I will ask him, do you know when was the last time you got the prescription? And he cannot also lie to me because I will see. And then I'll show it to him, he see, in, in, because I use electric, electronic records. So the patients now to prevent um, narcotic abuse, we are able to check the patient in the, in the data. That is a very safe method so that the patient will not be able to do from one doctor to another. Okay, so electronic health record is really, really good uh, in, in our practice. Oh, well, I, I was just going to add that uh, because the company I work for also, we have been transitioning to a specifically electronic medication record. But I just would like to emphasize that regardless whether you use a computer like a scanner, because right now, when you scan a patient's bracelet, if it says yes, then it means it's the right patient. But caveat, you still have to do your six R's. The right patient, the right dose, the right everything, because computers can make mistakes. So in our company, the company we work for, we've been doing like massive audits. We still have errors. Because a lot of nurses now, they're so dependent on computers but it doesn't take out, though, the human factor. So just a little caveat, regardless of the system, the technology, you still have to do your six, especially with um, electronic medication record. Thank you. Um, remind me your name later, though, because uh, I've been starting my own private practice, and I will be transitioning to a free electronic medical record. Um, I forgot the name of the website. Um, I used to pay, you know, $150 to keep my my documentation but there's a website that will actually give you a free trial or even free and i will give you that a link because uh, it's a good uh framework to begin with so you can create and make your own and design your own electronic health medical record moving forward so uh, 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 let me know approach me later yeah by the way informatics is another area for nurses to go into and it's like, you have to go, do you have to have a master's degree for informatics? Yeah, so I have friends who are in informatics. So if you like computer, you can be a consultant in, in, a, in a hospital in, in the in a United States, or you can be here and you can start your own practice. It's really a lot of uh, creative ideas. So that's why being a nurse, you can, you can choose what you like to do in life, right? Okay, thank you. This is the last two question. This is for Dr. Eller. Now, since you are advocating doctor of nursing practice, do you think in the Philippines is ready for it? Given the budget for health has been cut down, will there be any overlapping of responsibility 
between doctors and advanced nurse practitioner. So, not all states in the America are cre created equal as far as NP practice. So let me give you an example. In Washington State, I have full um, independent practice. I can prescribe. I can, uh, you know, do what uh, uh, whatever a doctor can do. Um, I'm even certified to prescribe narcotics such as naltrexone, suboxone, but you, you need extra um, schooling for that. But somewhere, somewhere in other states, you have to have a doctor's permission or something, or you have to work under a doctor. Yeah, you're under supervision. You're in collaboration with a psychiatrist for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, in which state is this? I'm Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. So in, in um, Washington, I can start my own private practice. I don't need to be under a supervision of a provider. So I'm very optimistic that we're having this conversation. Um, it may take a few years, but again, like what I said earlier, it will take a lot of policy changes, people on the front line to really do their homeworks, because it's, again, you, ha you have the PMA, you have governmental agencies, you have nursing faculty, you need to have trained faculty um, or advanced practice nurses, um, and most of it, or you're probably going to need help from, from, from internationally. Um, but this is a good time because we're talking about it and if we keep this conversation open, um, eventually we'll be able to uh, uh, have small wins and, and start the process for uh, advanced practice nursing here in the Philippines. Thank you. Now, this is the last question. Now, what do you think is the best advocacy that we student nurses can work on while studying? given the sitting here in Iloilo? So for me, I think, as I mentioned, we have to advocate for safety, even we're nursing students. I, you know, culturally, sometimes, you know, we're scared to stop the doctor, stop the line. You know, ask clarifying questions if we see that the doctor, as I said, simple illustration, a main, you know, just a hand washing that will spread infection, or a doctor that um, prescribed the wrong medication. We should not be scared. As long as we ask, you know, speak to the doctors professionally, as I said, this is, you know, the students, clinical instructors, we should empower our students, even with us when they question us. So we should really be uh, able to advocate for the safety of our patients, as I mentioned. You know, uh, we are far behind before, uh, you know, compared to the airline industry. We have to be, you know, that when the, the patient goes to the, to the hospital, they are under our care. We are mandated or obligated to do the best care in the best safe possible way that we can do. So we are charged as nurses to advocate students or professionals regardless. We have the obligation, you know, to do the best for the patients. As I said, you, you know, we have to change the culture and it has to start from us. If we don't, we, if we, do, we don't do it now, when? Because it might be too late. Thank you, speakers. Okay, audience, shall we give a round of applause to our speakers? That ends our interactive discussion. Thank you once again, dear speakers, for patiently answering the queries of our participants. And thank you, Dr. Baldon, for facilitating the uh, open forum. I would like to uh, call in Doc Attorney Salix Alibuga and our president, Ate Madeline Yu, because we would like to, I know earlier it, uh, they gave a book already from uh, PNAA, but my subchapter, the Ocean County subchapter in New Jersey were uh, one of the subchapters, and PNA New Jersey is the biggest subchapter in the U.S. We would like to donate another book. Uh, it's the same earlier, it's the Filipino Nurse Association of America, a tapestry, because we would like you to know all the leaders that paved the way for where we are now and how far did the PNA, you know, in the U.S. Um, able to change the policy, the practice. So I, on behalf of my subchapter, I would like uh, Ate Madeline to give this to uh, Dean Salex Alibuka.
Thank you very much, Mr. Gapilango, for the generosity. Now, let me call on on stage Dr. Charlie Baldon, MAN coordinator, to give her closing remarks. We are thankful for those who shared a fraction of their time, knowledge, and effort. We also would like to extend our greatest gratitude to the Philippine Nurses Association of America, Balikturo 2020, for generously sponsoring the needed financial allocations and sharing their valuable time, knowledge, and expertise. To the BSN4 Group 1 students, College of Nursing, under the leadership of Attorney Salex C. Alibuka, Dean, for tediously organizing this event. To the participants who share their cooperation and interest throughout the session. And above all, to our God Almighty, who made this activity fruitful and a successful one. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We are done with the year's International PNA of America Balik Turo activities. And of course, just like what Mambaldon said, we are so grateful with the presence and uh, effort of sharing to us from the PNA of America, their uh, past presidents, even the uh, present president, uh, Mom Yu, and other officers who are here today. We are so grateful. Also, we are so uh, lucky to have our speakers who have shared their expertise and knowledge this morning in an afternoon session. Thank you very much. Before, um, before we conclude our activity, I would like to call on our um, guests and officers of PNA of America to please uh, have a documentation on stage. Let's have a photo op with Sir uh, Ali Buga. And then, of course, the faculty of the College of Nursing are requested to stand by. Mom, sirs, now as they're preparing to go, to, uh, to go up the stage, let me read this. I would like to read a very important announcement. Requirements for all students level one and four. This announcement, by the way, it comes from our DN, Attorney Salik Salibuga. After the PNA 